everyone! In this video, we're going to talk about section 3.1c, which is about simplifying and solving trigonometric expressions. So we've looked at a handful of known identities so far. We had the reciprocal identities, the Pythagorean identities, and the co-function identities. This video is more so over a strategy than um, an identity, but however, if you can identify it, um, it's going to be definitely helpful. So our strategy that we're looking at is factoring. Okay, and so that's what... Um, Example one and two we're going to look at. So we're going to write each expression in factored form. So the first one that we're looking at is 3 sine squared x plus 4 sine x plus 1. And I have to know that when I'm looking at this like sine squared x, I know I need to interpret that as 3 quantity sine of x squared. So that's always helpful for me to look at. So one thing that can be helpful when we're going to factor it is I can see that it has the kind of the shape and the and the form of a quadratic but those sine of x's can sometimes cloud our vision and get in the way so sometimes using a substitution of variables can be helpful to at least factor it and then we can resubstitute so i'm going to let sine of x be equal to u and it doesn't matter the variable i'm just going to use kind of a dummy variable here so i'm going to rewrite this as 3u squared plus 4u plus 1 okay and so then going to factor it use whatever strategy you want to factor it. I always just like to use the guess and check method. Um, I'm going to have 3u and u. And then let's see, I want my last term to be a positive one. My middle term is a positive, so plus one, plus one. Cool. Yep. Okay. I think that's where I have it. And then we have to remember that we didn't initially start with u's. We started with sine, so I'm going to resubstitute sine in at the very end. So this is going to factor to be 3 of sine x plus 1 times the quantity sine x plus 1. Okay, and there we go. So again, factoring is going to be something that's usually something that we do later on to be able to simplify it. Um, but right now we're just practicing that factoring. So looking at the second one, we have 4 tangent squared x minus 4 over cotangent x plus sine x cosecant x. I know that if I'm going to want to factor it, which is what I want to do because the directions tell us to, uh, it's probably best if we maybe simplify a couple of little things. So for instance, I see that we have 4 over cotangent of x. I know that tangent x is equal to 1 over cotangent. We have that um, reciprocal identity. So we'll have 4 tangent squared x minus 4 tangent x, and then the sine x cosecant x, well, sine x times, I know that cosecant is the reciprocal of sine, so those are going to end up just being 1, so plus 1. So this is the, the form that we have it in. Um, go ahead, pause the video and try to factor it, and then when you're ready, go ahead and unpause the video and we can check our answers. Give it a chance. Okay, let's go ahead and check our answers. So um, going to factor it, we should get 2 tangent of x minus 1 times another quantity of 2 tangent of x minus 1. And then I'm going to go ahead and write this as the quantity, or 2 tangent of x minus 1, the quantity of that squared. Okay, so either of those are fine. Technically, this is the more simplified version of it. Um, and again, if it helps you to write the u's, absolutely go for it. I, that's something that I always kind of like to do just so I... I don't get distracted, but then just make sure that you go ahead and change it back into tangents because that's what our original equation or our original expression had in it. Okay, so we learned um, factoring and why is this helpful? Well, sometimes things that look like they're going to be an identity are not necessarily going to be an identity. Okay, and so in, in these two examples, we're going to write the expression um, as a single trigonometric function. Looking at this for or looking at example three, I have cotangent squared x minus one. Okay. What I mean by factoring being helpful is that if we were try going to try to use like a Pythagorean identity here, we're going to have a bad time. And why are we going to have a bad time? Well, I know that cotangent squared x plus 1 is equal to cosecant squared x, but cotangent squared x minus 1 is not equal to any of the, the, um, the identities that we know so far. So that should be kind of a clue in to you that if this sign is not what you want it to be and this sign is what you want it to be, there might be not an identity that we want to do, but maybe we want to go ahead and try factoring, okay? So if I were to just, again, I'm going to use the substitution of variables just so I can rewrite this really fast. If I let u be equal to cotangent x, I can rewrite my numerator as u squared minus 1, and I know that's going to factor to be u plus 1 times u minus 1. It's a difference of squares. So I know that this expression in the numerator actually factors to be cotangent of x plus 1 times cotangent of x minus 1. 
okay? And so when I'm looking at the denominator, I see that I do have the same factor in the numerator and the denominator, so I am able to divide out those factors, okay? So the cotangent x plus 1 will divide out. That's just going to leave me with cotangent of x minus 1. Okay, so again, be looking for some of those factoring tricks, especially when the Pythagorean identities don't work out. And so we're going to look at number four as well, okay? So again, we have one minus cotangent of x. We really would want this to be a positive cotangent of x, but it's not, and there's no way I can factor out a negative to make it what I want, so we're going to go ahead and try to factor it. Um, I know that this numerator, hello, this numerator is going to factor to be, instead of, it's going to be one minus cotangent of x and one plus cotangent of x. So again, just another difference of squares. Okay, and this is over cotangent of x minus 1. <coughs> All right, okay, so we go to try to find the same factor of the numerator and the denominator, and we're going to run into an issue. Okay, again, because our signs aren't necessarily what we want. Like, for instance, I see that in the denominator I have a positive cotangent of x, but then right here I have a minus or a negative 1. Okay, and neither of my factors in the numerator also do that. So to get around it, what we're going to do is um, we're going to find... Well, okay, a couple of different things we could do. Um, basically, if we don't have the same signs that we want, um, let's go ahead and try factoring out a negative from one of these factors to see if we can get it to what we want to be. So I'm going to choose the denominator, and I'm going to factor a negative out. So that's going to leave me with a negative cotangent of x and then a positive 1. And so in the numerator, I have 1 minus cotangent of x and then 1 plus cotangent of x. <coughs> All right, okay, so this looked like a good idea because I have that negative cotangent of x and then I have a positive one. So I do have the same factor in the numerator and the denominator. So when I go ahead to simplify this, I'm gonna get negative quantity one plus cotangent of x. All right, so factoring can definitely be a useful skill. So again, it's not gonna necessarily show up on your um, trig identities card, at least I don't think it is off the top of your head, but it is a skill that you'll wanna keep in mind. When you're ready, let's go ahead. We're going to turn over to our next page, and we're going to kind of switch gears. So in these examples on this page, we're going to be solving trigonometric equations. Before, we were just simplifying a more complicated expression into something uh, more succinct and simplified. This one, we're actually looking for solutions that make an equation true. There's two different types of um, types of problems in this. The first one is where we're going to be looking for values that are within a specific interval. So questions 5 through 7 have to do with finding solutions that are between 0 and 2 pi. Okay, and that interval might be able to change, but that's where we're looking for our solutions for. The second type of equation, or yeah, se second type of problem is where we're looking for all values of x. Okay, so we're not given a specific interval. We're looking for anything that would fit the solution to this equation. So question number five, we have square root of two cotangent x times sine x minus cotangent x equals zero. Okay, don't write anything down yet, but I'm going to show you something that we don't want to do, and I'll explain why. So one thing that you might notice is like, oh, I have a cotangent of x right here. So I could, you know, add that negative cotangent of x over. Okay, and you're like, oh, well, I have a factor of cotangent in each one. Let's divide by cotangent. Okay, and so that would leave you the square root of 2 sine x equals 1. If we do this and you divide by something that has an x in it, you divide out one of our, our trig terms, you're going to lose a whole batch of solutions. Okay, so we don't want to do that. What we're going to do instead is we're going to look for a way to manipulate this a little bit so we don't end up accidentally getting rid of all of our, getting rid of a set of solutions. So, um, again, that observation that I made, they both have a cotangent of x in it. Let's go ahead and factor out a cotangent. So I'll have cotangent of x, and then I'm left with a square root of 2 sine x, and then when I factor a cotangent out here, that leaves me with a minus 1. And so this is equal to 0. So we have a zero product property going on where I have two terms that are multiplied and they're set equal to 0, so I know that I can set each of them equal to 0 and solve for x from there. Oops. All right. 
Okay, so now we're looking to see where cotangent of x is equal to zero. Whenever I'm trying to solve something that uses a, a cotangent or a tangent, I always like to rewrite it as like cosine and sine. So this is going to be cosine of x over sine of x equals zero. So I know here, since the numerator is equal to cosine, that's really where I'm trying to figure out what's making it zero. Because if I make the denominator zero, that's going to make it undefined. So where is cosine of x equal to zero? And this is where um, our interval comes into play. We're looking for solutions that kind of fit within here. So if I'm thinking about our unit circle, where on the unit circle is cosine equal to zero? Remember, cosine's x. So there's two values that are going to make that true. So we have x equals pi over 2, and then x equals 3 pi over 2. Okay, and then just double checking, those both fall within my interval. So I'm going to go ahead and box them for right now, but we'll check back on them later. Okay, so there's, there's one set of solutions. Now I have to go ahead and I'm going to solve the other part. So we had the square root of 2 sine x minus 1 equals 0. Let's go ahead, we'll add 1 to both sides. So we'll have square root of 2 sine x equals 1. Divide by square root of 2. So I have sine x equals 1 over square root of 2. And I am going to go ahead and rationalize that denominator. So it's going to be the square root of 2 over 2. So I'm thinking, okay, where on my unit circle is sine of x equal to positive square root of 2 over 2? Well, that happens in two places, okay? I think we're happening at x equals pi over 4, and then x equals 3 pi over 4. Okay, so there's my second set of solutions. So before you go ahead and you dust off your hands and you're like, wow, easy peasy lemon squeezy, let's move on to the next question. We're going to stop, okay? You might have noticed that I had this set of directions up here. I've been ignoring it, but we're going to come back to it. Okay, so it says check for extraneous solutions. Whenever you get a set of answers, we need to go back in and make sure that this works in all values of x and in all parts of our original equation, okay? Meaning that I'm, I knew that my, my pi over 2 and my 3 pi over 2 came from that cotangent portion, so I know that it's going to work here. It's going to work here, okay? It's not going to give me any sort of undefined behavior. But I also need to make sure that those values would not produce undefined behavior in like sine of x, for instance. Okay, good news for us, it's not going to be. So I know that both of these are not going to be extraneous. They are going to work, okay? I'm going to do the same thing with pi over 4 and 3 pi over 4, okay? Those came from the sine of x portion. Okay, so I know it works there. But I need to make sure, okay, does it produce undefined behavior in cotangent? It doesn't. So those are also solutions. So we do end up with four solutions for this equation. We're going to look at number six next, okay? So number six, again, we have cosine of x tangent squared x equals cosine of x. Again, we don't want to go ahead and try to divide out that cosine. We're going to lose um, out on some solutions. So let's go ahead and get everything over to the same side of the equation like we had in number five, and then I think we're going to be able to factor it. So I'm going to have cosine of x tangent squared x minus cosine x equals zero. Okay, let's go ahead and factor out a cosine. Okay, so I see that I have the product of two factors set equal to zero, so I can set each of these equal to zero, and we're going to go ahead and solve from there. So, let's see. I want to have enough room. Okay, um, looking at r tangent squared x minus 1. So again, I know that I'm, I'm going to interpret this as tangent of x quantity squared minus 1 equals 0. So I'm going to add that 1 over to both sides. So I'll have tangent squared x equals 1. Okay, and again, if I think about this as the quantity of tangent x being squared, if I want to undo that squared, I'm going to take the square root of both sides. So that'll just leave me with tangent of x, and then I know that the square root of 1 is just 1, but again, we took a square root, so I'm going to add that plus or minus in there. So we are looking for between 0 and 2 pi, again, not including 2 pi, <coughs> um, we're looking for values that make tangent equal to plus or minus 1. If I think about that tangent in terms of sine and cosine, we're looking for what value of x are going to make sine and cosine be equal to each other. Well, that's going to be 
are um, are multiples of pi over 4. So we'll have x equals pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, and 7 pi over 4. Okay, so there's the first batch of solutions. <coughs> All right, okay, the next one, um, we have one more to do. We have cosine of x equals 0. So thinking of unit circle, again, from that first one, we should know that this happens at x equals pi over 2 and then 3 pi over 2. <clears throat> All right, okay, so we have six different possible solutions. Let's make sure none of them are extraneous. So <coughs> the multiples of pi over 4 came from the tangent portion, so definitely satisfied this part. Are those values going to work in cosine? And I think, yes, they are. Okay, cosine is not undefined for um, any of the multiples of pi over 4. So all of those will work. <coughs> Talking for a long period of time makes my throat dry. Sorry, everyone. Okay, um, with those pi over 2s, though, okay, so those came from the cosine. So I know that they work for cosine and cosine here. But does it work for tangent? And I don't think it's going to, okay, because I know that the tangent graph has asymptotes at the multiples of pi, or like pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, things like that, okay? Because remember, cosine is 0 there. Well, I know that tangent has that cosine in the denominator that's going to produce undefined behavior. So both of these are extraneous. Okay, so that means that we only end up with four solutions, and we got rid of two of them. Okay, so we've done five, we've done fifth, or we've done six. Number seven, um, I want you to go ahead and try number seven on your own before you come to class. Just try it out, um, and then we will check over our answers and make sure that we're all on the same page. Okay, last one that we're going to look at is um, example 8. So we're going to find all values of x that satisfy the given equation, and we are going to use our graphing calculator. <clears throat> so we have tangent of x is equal to e. Okay, there's nowhere, at least on my knowledge, okay, you might be on a different wavelength than me. I don't know any values of, you know, any radians that are going to give us exactly e out. Remember, e is, oh, jeez, what is it? It's like 2.8. 718 or something like that okay and it's a repeating number e is euler's number e so yeah don't know about that so this is where we're gonna use our graphing calculator okay if we wanted to go ahead and solve for x i know that i'm gonna use tangent inverse okay so x is equal to tangent inverse of e and if you go ahead and type this into your calculator remember you want to go ahead and be in radians so just double check that okay you should get Something along the lines of x is equal to 1.218. <coughs> okay, and before you circle it and you think, well, wow, we're all done, ready to roll, done with this video, not quite, okay? That's actually not the only solution, because remember, it's saying that we want all values of x. So your, val your calculator only gave you one, but there's actually a lot, okay? And fingers crossed that this is going to work, because m my iPad keeps crashing, but we'll see what we can get. Okay, so I'm actually going to graph this so I can prove to you that there are multiple solutions. Okay, so I have tangent of x, and then I have e. Okay, we'll let this be it's equal to y. <clears throat> okay, so again, here's the tangent graph. I know that it has, you know, it's periodic. We have multiple waves. Here's the solution our calculator gave us, but I have all of these other solutions here. A lot, right? I, I can keep going out. Yeah, there there's a lot of solutions, okay? So it's probably not in our best interest to try to find all of them as, well, again, there's an infinite, an infinite number of them. So how can we use this one solution that we found to be able to generate all of the other ones? Well, let's just keep in mind that we found one solution on just one period, but how would we find a solution on the next period? <clears throat> we would just have to add another period over, okay? And so our period of tangent is going to be pi. So I bet you, I bet you that if I take 1.218 and I add pi to it, that's going to give me the next solution over. 
and it does, okay? And I bet if I subtracted pi, it would give me the solution to the period to the left, and it does, okay? So we're gonna take our one solution that our calculator found. It found the first one <coughs> just within um, negative two pi to two pi, or negative pi over two to pi over two, okay? Just within that one first period. We're just gonna use that to generate all of the other ones. Okay, I don't think it crashed. This is great news for us. Okay, um, I've had to record this like three times. So how we're gonna write this, we're gonna say that x is equal to 1.218. Okay, so that's that value <clears throat> that we found. And then I'm gonna add plus n pi, where n is an integer, okay? So again, by doing this, first of all, this z here, it represents the integers. It's kind of like the r is all real numbers. The z is the integers, okay? So I'm saying that if I use any sort of integer n and I add pi, you know, that many pi's to it, that's going to generate all of the possible values. Okay, that is all for this video. Uh, go ahead and make sure that you have question number seven done before you come to class, and then I will see you all later.